Dr. Odie, just so that way I get this right, can I get you to say and spell your first and last name? You can. Uh, first name is Ken, K-E-N, last name Odie, O-D-D-E. And where are you from? Or wh where are you, I guess, where are you living? <laughs> uh, Manhattan, Kansas. Is that okay? Or should this, am I a rancher today or am I a you're, college you're professor? A college professor. Okay, I'll be a college professor today. <laughs> I, I have uh, a, an assortment of hats. Yes, Very yes. Good. Can you give me a little background on some of those hats? Well, uh, my background is I'm a native of South Dakota, uh, graduate of South Dakota State, bachelor's in animal science, two years in the Army, graduate school and veterinary school at Kansas State University, 11 years at Colorado State, and uh, then uh, eight years in industry, most of that with Pfizer, four years back at North Dakota State, and now 11 years back at Kansas State. Served as the Department Head of Animal Sciences and Industry for 11 years at K-State. So that's kind of my background. Gosh, yes. Now I'm going to have to try and not sound stupid, right? Yeah. Well, I actually, in fact, uh, I have delivered the <clears throat> Tadashek lecture at Oklahoma State. Okay. Did you, do you know about the Tadashek lecture? Uh, not a lot. Not a lot? I've okay. Yes. Well, they usually bring in someone each year. You must have missed that lecture. I, yeah. yeah. I was, <laughs> no, I wasn't in on that one. Okay. Yeah. But I did that in 2006. Yeah. So I, I know a lot of Oklahoma Staters, and uh, Clint Rusk was my graduate student at Colorado State. Yes, yes. I forget that he was a Colorado Yeah, yes. So, well, okay, just to kind of kick things off, can you kind of walk me through uh, just kind of the history of genetic selection and uh, kind of how crossbreeding became relevant? Okay, well, I'd be happy to do that. In fact, at our luncheon today, we were having an interesting conversation. Uh, I think uh, Donald posed the question about changes that you've observed and I was I'm old enough to remember when our beef industry was primarily made up of two breeds of cattle the Hereford breed and the Angus breed in fact the Hereford breed was the dominant breed and then we uh, imported uh, a number of breeds European breeds and that really was the advent of crossbreeding in our US beef industry and I would say since that time we've had uh, a, a lot of efforts uh, designed to really take advantage of of heterosis for a whole variety of traits, but we really have uh, not been nearly as effective in utilizing heterosis as we could be. Um, how do you get producers to kind of really buy into heterosis? Well, I think I think the big challenge is that we've always thought of heterosis as a result of the proper breeding systems, and and that's really true. We can design breeding systems that really. Uh, really uh, allow us to really maximize our benefits of a heterosis. On the other hand, those breeding systems are many times challenging, sometimes complicated to manage. And uh, I think what we forget is that we, we got a lot of big ranches that run in country where uh, they don't have, uh, it isn't easy to have certain breeds of bulls in one pasture and other breeds of bulls in another pasture. And even our own ranching operation in South Dakota, we lease a lot of pasture. We run cattle with some neighbors at times. So it's, it's not easy to design, I'll call it breeding systems, and make those work effectively in commercial cattle environments. There's a lot of outside factors. That's correct. And so one of, the, one of the things that I was visiting with Sherry about, and one of my interests now, is with the advent of our genomics, uh, we now are at the point where we can uh, actually uh, determine a breed composition uh, within herd. And I believe uh, as we get tools that really allow us to use that information, we can actually do a much, much better job of maximizing heterosis within a herd just by how we mate cattle within that herd to each other. How we assign AI sires to particular animals, and then how we even sort the bull population that we have uh, within that herd. And if you think about the particularly maternal heterosis, and this is where I think we are underutilizing heterosis the most, and uh, I think for two traits primarily, one is fertility and one is longevity, uh, that's where I think we are, we're, we're missing the boat. If you look at the 
the maternal heterosis effect, especially for longevity, it's, it's a rather significant effect. It's a really important trait because the cost to develop replacement heifers is high relative to the cost of maintaining mature cows. So the ability to be able to get uh, one or two more calves out of that cow, that's a huge economic uh, effect. So lifetime productivity is really affected by heterosis. Well, I, I think the Solaire breed, uh, uh, like many breeds, fits very nicely into uh, crossbreeding programs. You know, I'm talking primarily about crossbreeding and heterosis, but we also have the issue of complementarity, the benefit that we get from matching uh, genotypes to each other to complement each other, uh, in addition to just the heterosis effect that we actually get. So, yep, uh, clearly there's, uh, there's some uh, obvious uh, benefits there. I, I would argue that uh, you know if you have a predominantly Angus cow herd and you really are interested in in uh, profitability, which I think is heavily influenced by fertility and longevity, you clearly ought to be interested in breeds other than Angus uh, for for going on to that cow herd. Uh, that's clearly what you need to do in order to uh, to uh, maximize the use of heterosis. Well, you know, on the terminal side, and you can gain both from the heterosis effect uh, by simply having a terminal breed that uh, is of a breed different than your uh, base cow herd, and uh, you get the benefits. Uh, generally, in the terminal breed, you're looking for the both the heterosis effect, but also the advantages that you would typically expect in growth and carcass traits associated with a terminal breed. Well, I, I think the educational tools that come out of our universities, uh, particularly the tools on breeding systems, I don't want to, to diminish that too much. I mean, those are, those are useful and they're proven. They're just difficult to implement and manage. That's what I'm actually going to say. Uh, and I don't want to diminish that at all. I really think what happens is we're just on the very beginning edge of this whole world of genomics. And I think we think of it primarily in terms of genetic improvement. So additive genetic improvement is how we're thinking about the value of genomics. And what I'm suggesting is that there may be some uh, other values that creep in here. And I'm simply saying that knowing breed composition and being able to use that information to uh, to, to capture more value through heterosis, I think is, uh, is going to be a, something we're going to really be thinking about in the future. We went over that. We had a conversation. I guess, last thing, what's the future of crossbreeding? What's the future? I think we'll see an industry as uh, it, it, you know, what we have is an industry that, and it's been this way for a long time, but it's kind of a divergent industry. So we have a, we have a significant portion of the commercial industry that continues to get bigger and bigger herds, continues to get, I'll call it, uh, uh, better at their management. And when I say better, it's, a, it's not necessarily more intensive management. In some cases, it's more intensive. Some places, it's more extensive. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's a higher level of management, and, and I think that's going to continue. And the competition within the industry will continue to drive us to, 
to use the best technology that we can use that'll help us with profitability. And one of those technologies that I, I believe is very underutilized today is heterosis. So the question about we can use genomics for parentage, uh, and I think that is another uh, opportunity. You got to also realize though at the commercial side, we commercial people are very cost sensitive. So we're going to be making the investments in the technologies where the investments make sense. Okay, and, and so if you look at even the conversations we're having here this morning at BIF, this, uh, this conversation about cost and the ability to manage cost, that's absolutely critical. We, historically in the beef industry, we're probably a little too much driven by the, the uh, production side of the industry and perhaps not as driven as we need to be on the cost side. Uh, but that's just, uh, that's what's required of good management is we have to be uh, equally aware of our our opportunities to influence profit both on the production side and on the cost side. Go right ahead, yes, ma'am. So, we, what, what, maybe what you're saying to some extent as well, that it's the information era. It doesn't have to be complicated information, it's just how we make use of it. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, it is a, I, I would use this example in that if you really look at what I would call the best managers in cow-calf production, every day they're looking for something new, different. They're not necessarily going to jump on it. They're going to do what I think they should do is analyze it thoroughly. Uh, you know, it isn't always the first adopters that makes the, the most money. The people that really study the issues. And right now, uh, I'll tell you, it's a time where this is this is this is changing a lot. One of the factors I want to mention is that one of the things that we're seeing quite a bit of now is is more confined beef cow herds, confined or semi-confined, fed high concentrate diets. That's clearly a reflection of uh, our grass costs have been going up rather substantially, corn costs have been rather stable, so we're seeing more corn utilization. Good managers are figuring that out. If it's cheaper to put cows on feed somewhere uh, than it is to rent pasture for those cows, they're going to do that. That's part of managing that cost side of the equation. And that's happening uh, in, in, uh, in quite a few areas right now. It's, no, I think it's great. Yeah. You can, you can cut out 96%.